should probably do. Hi there, my name is George Green. It's a really sunny 30 degrees uh, Tuesday the 20th of July and rather than Stuart and I being somewhere like the Caribbean in this heat, we're actually in the UK, which is surprising. So uh, my name is Jared. I'm based at the London Men's Health Physio Clinic in Marleybone and uh, it gives me great pleasure on this uh, sunny evening to speak to Dr. Stuart Daly and Stuart is a specialist GP who has uh, many interests and, ex and expertise in many areas, but he's got a real interest in men's health. So, uh, and Stuart and I are based in the same premises in Marleybone. And it's really great to have Stuart and his expertise there alongside the work we do in, in the men's health physio clinic. So Stuart, uh, just to start, just tell us a bit about what you do in relation to men's health. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so nice to see you again, Gerard. And uh, you're quite right; it's a it's a balmy day, uh, so we'll try and uh, we'll try and keep it punchy, I guess. But um, yeah, I, as you've rightly identified, I've got uh, a variety of hats, and um, but uh, and so what I've done with my business is, is, is encapsulate them under the men's health and the woman's health, even though there are some common areas. For example, hair loss management, uh, facial skin health management, so on and so forth pelvic sexual health management and of course there are you know significant and obvious differences there um in the men's health re uh, realm of course with my gp hat uh, i tend to do a lot of men's health um and privately uh, there's a lot of focus on um erectile dysfunction management and um pelvic pain of course and uh to a smaller extent uh things like peronies and and and, uh, and similar conditions to that um within that i think it's worth mentioning that we i always like to take a holistic approach and uh and and really address the the whole patient and firstly make sure that there's nothing from a wider pathology point of view yeah, yeah. That, that could be contributing to their uh to their feeling suboptimal let's get let's get all that dealt with first and foremost secondarily i'll then move on to lifestyle uh management because it's uh, it's it's incredible how common um, you know the fact that someone may be overweight. We can talk about that in a bit more depth later. How that can impact on on um, you know libido, motivation, these sorts of things. Um, once all that's been addressed, then that absolutely, then we, we work, we move on to the specific treatments, and uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we'll come on to that, Gerard. Yeah. That's brilliant. It's a brilliant overview of what you do. And like all the Zoom interviews we do, we've, we kind of reach out to to real patients and we've asked them really to, you know, to send in some questions that are really relevant to them. Mm. And I suppose my first question to you is, and it's it's one that lots of men ask, particularly those say with, with pelvic pain, is uh, when I go to the GP initially, which is which is really important, which is we recommend that they all go to see the GP first. Uh, so what tests might the GP do with these men who've got suspected male pelvic pain? Mm, of course. Yeah. So as with any uh, consultation, really, it all starts with the history. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a it's a we want to encourage uh, men to attend for appointments, whether it be on the NHS to their GP or privately, because we know historically they've been a little, a little less forward in, in coming forward um, compared to women. And I think that's part of the reason why there's still a significant un unmet need. But once they've made that step, they've got over the threshold of, of having the appointment. And I have to say that's much that seems to be happening much more commonly now than perhaps, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but so once they've once they've attended a good and full history uh, to make sure that, that there's no other causes, uh, as I've said, touched on earlier, that needs to be addressed, we'll then uh, examine them, of course. Uh, or relevant examinations and then we move on to some specific tests and within the tests we certainly want to do some some relatively straightforward uh, health screen bloods uh, we want to do a urine check make sure there's nothing in the urine that shouldn't be there and again if it's a if it's a simple fix fix it uh, treat it straight away and if not manage it in the in the uh, in the ensuing weeks or months um, we then move on to more specialized tests and that might be things for example like hormone profiles and things like that to determine uh you know if there's anything that's deranged in that department um and so if you like we're slowly slowly closing the net 
is how I think of it. So we start with a very wide net and gradually we're, we're narrowing down to the specific area that is, uh, that is going to give the, the, the best management outcome for the individual patients. But by starting with the broad net, you, you, you sort of take a, it means that you take a good holistic approach, as I was mentioning earlier. Brilliant. And say with those blood tests, so for the, the patients or the, you know, the partners of those patients who will be listening to the, to the interview, so what are the specific things in those blood tests that you and your colleagues are looking for? Of course, yeah. So, well, I mean, we want when I say a, a fairly generic health screen, I would I would incorporate things like and I don't know if everyone will be familiar with these terms, but things like a full blood count. Um, that, that's, of course, going to check for things like hemoglobin and also white cells. So clues for infection, uh, which are very relevant, of course, with pelvic pain. Um, we're going to do liver function tests. We're going to do renal function tests, sometimes referred to as use and ease. Um, we most certainly will do an inflammatory marker. Specific to men, of course, uh, particularly above a certain age, we're going to want to check the PSA, uh, prostate specific antigen is what it stands for. And it has an age based range. And, uh, you know, if we see above the normal range, um, particularly in concert with a with what we call a digital uh, examination of the prostate. Um, you know, if, if, if the two things give us any concern, then we'll, we'll take things down that avenue in terms of how to manage it. Um, but, but many times it's a reassuring picture. You know, it's a case of both the exam and the, and the blood test is normal. So you can start to exclude uh, a significant number of conditions, which is also incredibly helpful in the, in the, in the final analysis. Um, in terms of further blood tests, we'll of course want to check for things like diabetes. Uh, we, we refer to that test as a HbA1c. And, uh, and we'd like to do, again, I mentioned lifestyle. We'd like to check things like your, your lipids, make sure that that's all where it should be because your cardiovascular health is incredibly important to your wider men's health, if I can put it that way, uh, and more specifically your pelvic health. Um, so if there's any derangement there, again, we want to manage that. And again, when we talk about management, we start with lifestyle and then we move on to other areas and they may be medications. It may be further investigations sometimes uh, and so on and so forth. And then we are going to do a separate talk on the on erectile dysfunction. But in terms of the hormone tests that these men might have, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're going to do a, a, a fairly uh, extensive uh, hormone profile. Um, so within that, you, of course, want the testosterone measured. It's, uh, it's also incredibly helpful to have the free testosterone. Uh, and, and as a consequence or as an inference from that, you, you also want to know uh, a blood test called um, sex hormone binding globulin. Um, you would, it's helpful to know the uh, estrogen. So just as women have, uh, and it's very essential for them to have a, a degree of testosterone in, in their uh, bodies, similarly as guys, we have uh, some degree of estrogen and it's very important for us, but it must be at the right levels. So we check that also. If we have any concerns about any wider endocrine condition from the history or the examination, we might expand out those tests specifically in the bloods, there may be other hormones we might wish to measure, thyroid function and so on and so forth. But it, it, that, would be, that would very much be dependent on the, um, on, on the initial history and examination. Brilliant. And a lot, a lot of the men that we see with, with pelvic pain uh, probably will have type three prostatitis, but a lot of them are very uh, prostate focused. There's a lot of confusion around that with patients. So is it, I'm sorry, Jim, I, I, missed, I missed what you said there. Something about... Oh, sorry, apologies. So a lot of the men that we see with pelvic pain will tend to fall under that umbrella of type 3 prostatitis. Mm. But they'll still be... There's, there's still a little bit of confusion in the patients. Do I have a prostate problem or not? So is it routine that they will have a prostate ultrasound or not really? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think it, uh, if, it's, if it's that chronic, um, it's certainly only going to be helpful in terms of uh, elucidating uh, under, excuse me, underlying cause. But uh, is it critical and essential prior to treatment? 
I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think I think we'd have to uh, reserve judgment on that one. Yeah, perfect. And then a question, like when, when I put out a call to question, when I put out a call for questions, uh, lots of people messaged in saying that, uh, so these are men with pelvic pain, that, uh, you know, my blood tests have come back as normal. I've been told that I don't have an infection, but my specialist or GP has prescribed me course after course of antibiotics. So it's kind of that, that, that confusion there, whereas there isn't any clinical signs of an infection. Bloods are normal, but lots of antibiotics. Mm, yeah. So I think on that one, Gerard, I'm going to step out of the recording just for a second. <laughs> and uh, if that's all right with you. Not a problem. And, and fire that right back at you. Yeah, just fire that one back at you. Um, it, which which might be beneficial to record your answer actually so when you do encounter okay you go. Back. yeah go sorry. we're back we're back on yeah yeah so when, when we're uh, when you encounter pelvic pain where as far as we can determine we haven't picked up signs of infection but we are suspecting prostatitis from your management point of view what do you what do you recommend at that stage I think that I think by the time we see the patient, they're at a very different phase. So we will see patients probably on average, maybe 18 months, two years down the line. Mm. So we will be seeing very chronic, chronic or persistent pelvic pain. So we mm. tend to see them when they've gone through those cycles of antibiotics. So we're right. not see, we're not seeing them in the acute stage or not seeing them at three, six months. So I think by the time they get to us, they've maybe been through two, three courses of antibiotics. Uh, some have had some change from them, some not. Uh, but, but I think by the time they've got to us, they are usually have come off those courses of antibiotics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we will see patients uh, where they've gone to the GP, urology, possibly colorectal, if there's a colorectal mm. component, mm. possibly pain management, uh, but we're not seeing them in that acute stage because they do, as you said, they do need to go through that really thorough screening to check that mm. there's something else untoward like. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so when you when you get to the point of managing them, when they're in those cases where it is 18 to 24 months down the line, are you managing cases who who, who for the most part, have seen a urologist or oh, they've all seen they've all, they've seen, all seen one fine yeah, and okay. if they haven't yeah. seen one which is like i'd say in the last two three years i'd say i've seen yeah. a handful of patients that haven't been through urology and then yeah. they, they we send them to urology right so we we as a, the patients we see have have been through that uh normal path we have gp Mm -hmm. urology maybe another specialist uh, yeah. so if, if yeah. patients would come through to us that they hadn't been through that which is very rare here in the uk mm. it's different other countries uh you know we put them through that standard medical uh screening i think that's really yeah. important to stress that they, yeah, have to go, that they have to go through that absolutely and once they <clears throat> once they've done that sorry joe i realize i've turned this right back on you no no it's fine it's fine once, once they've uh once they've done you know once they've been with the gp for a while and the gp's let's let's say done a, a fairly full primary care workup um sadly they haven't improved but we have excluded a lot of things at that point they've then been sent on to the urologist who once again has has done his secondary care workup and is and is you know uh has again excluded a lot of you know arguably well more sinister uh, yeah, causes, yeah. but is but has determined that uh but it's a chronic prostatitis that's, in, that's uh, resulting in pelvic pain um, and then commissions your professional help to, uh, to manage that situation. What do you, what's the, what's the process that you take a patient through in that scenario? I think, I think without deviating too far, I think what we spend a lot of time, we probably see them for an hour and a half. We do a, a kind of a really detailed questioning working out you know what's going on uh, where they are currently the impact um, we want to work out what urinary bowel erectile ejaculatory symptoms they have pain uh, and then in terms of assessment we do um, 
a lot of spinal stuff. We do a mm. lot of ultrasound, pelvic floor, transabdominal, transpernal. We do a lot of internal examination. And I think what we tend to do is, is try and target the urinary bowel pain erectile. So it's very holistic. Mm. Uh, but they do well. Well, they do well. But I think, I think with urology, the key thing, and it's really good that, you know, the sinister stuff is ruled out. Mm. But I think there is a degree of frustration for the patient in that they're sometimes being, being inadvertently told that, you know, the really good news is there's nothing sinister going on here. But sometimes they're kind of left to their own devices. Yes. Yeah. Which, I, I, think, which, I think you're right. That, that, that's, always a, that's always a risk, uh, particularly the NHS side of things. Um, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, you're back, you're back. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I think, I think you know, often, often uh, you know, very good management uh, from the point of view of managing sinister uh, causes uh, when once identified, but um, but as you say, sometimes it's a case of well, the 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 series is excluded. Um, you know, it's a stand down principle almost. You know, so uh, that's where that's where the likes of uh, specialized care, the likes of which you're offering, and of course, you know, myself as well with certain certain treatments. And I guess we'll come on to that in the, yeah. in the next episode. Um, you know, can can be best beneficial. It's and quite a journey. It's quite a journey for the patient to get to that point, though, isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah, and quite a long, uh, challenging one. And I think some other questions patients have for you is, uh, obviously, pain is a big factor for these men, particularly the ones who've got quite high levels, debilitating pain. So, you know, a lot of some of the medication they put on is amitriptyline. Yeah, they may be put on gabapentin. Uh, so. What are the difference? And men will ask, well, you know, I've been prescribed amitriptyline, I've been prescribed gabapentine, I've been prescribed other analgesics. So what's what's the difference between some of those big drugs? Very just at yeah. a very basic level. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. And I, and I think <clears throat> whenever I'm asked a pain question, I take it back to first principles, uh, almost the kind of first principles that we're from which we're taught um, at medical school, which is to to appreciate uh, a, a concept called the analgesic ladder. Um, so we start light and we build up effectively because you want to get the maximum benefit for with the least. Least amount of. In, right. Okay, so uh, welcome back to Stuart. We're going to blame the heat for that one, for that dropout. And uh, the question was really just what's the difference between some of those uh, uh, pain medication? Yes. Gerard, shall I, as you suggested, shall I turn the video off just to, just to make the bandwidth a bit more effective? Yeah, lovely. All right. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure how much we've got there, uh, uh, Gerard, before it cut out, but essentially what I was driving at there is um, when I'm whenever I'm addressing a pain question I like to take it back to first principles uh, the likes of which that uh, we we were uh, taught uh, you know all the way back at med school which are absolutely applicable all the way through one's one's career <clears throat> in medicine and I think it's quite useful for patients to appreciate that we don't just pluck you know random items out of the air but rather there's a construct which we refer to as the analgesic ladder and, uh, and within that, we start light um, and we build up because it, it's, it's not unsurprisingly the case that many times when you go to pain medications that are stronger, that are more effective against pain, it's not that uncommon that they will have greater side effects. Not always true, but, but it's not, it's not a, a bad way of thinking about it. So less is more. The less you, you know, you want to manage the pain, yes, but you want to titrate that the management to the correct level so that you're not so you're minimizing side effects so with that in mind you start with a uh, nice straightforward uh, uh, medications like paracetamol if a uh, patient can tolerate it and they don't have any other contraindications and you protect their stomach at the same time all these kind of things you can consider anti-inflammatories 
you can always consider mild opiates, uh, the likes of which uh, would be something like codeine phosphate. But again, that has side effects, a classic one being constipation, but there are others. Um, and then, you know, usually, however, as you've been saying before, when patients get to the point that they're, uh, you know, they've, they've been to the neurologist already, they're now seeing you, maybe me, for some, uh, for some uh, more specialized management, they've probably been through the mill on various pain medications. And it's a good chance that they'll have progressed to other classes of analgesia, which were the types that you mentioned there. So gabapentin is a, comes under a class of medication that's, that's, that's used for uh, typically for neuropathic pain, but increasingly explored in other areas as well. And it's, it's globally known as a gabapentinoid. Um, another example of that is pregabalin, of course, uh, can be effective, both of those. Um, but they, again, like, like all medications, come with, uh, with some side effects. Amitriptyline is, we know, is a, is a tricyclic medication um, and can be very good for all kinds of, uh, of, of pain-based uh, conditions. So um, exactly why that's helpful uh, in this particular condition isn't necessarily entirely clear, but that's often the case also, you know, uh, when, when using drugs initially, maybe off license and things like that. So... Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's brilliant. Right. And then, Stuart, yeah. just two final questions on the medication. Uh, we see lots of these men get uh, constipation, and that leads to, you know, increase in pelvic pain on bowel movements, or they'll get uh, maybe scrotal or penile pain on bowel movements, and constipation tends to increase their maybe urinary frequency and urinary urgency. So is there any kind of medication? And we know there's lots of lifestyle stuff around constipation, but in terms of medication, is there anything that may help with constipation in these men? Yeah, 100%. And again, you can think of it like a ladder approach. So and you'll be amazed in my in both my private practice and my uh, my NHS practice, uh, the amount of times I'm correcting people's chronic dehydration is just uncanny. <laughs> and it's a, such an easy fix and it makes such a huge difference to so many aspects of bodily function, not least of which uh, bowel function. Of, and of course, a uh, consequence of, of, of dehydration can, can be. Uh, constipation. So one of the very first things to, to assess is fluid hydration levels over a chronic time scale. Uh, assuming that that's okay or that that's been fixed, absolutely. You look at life, rest of the lifestyle, exercise, diet, those sort of things. But then if, you're, if you've optimized all things and it just is the case that the patient has, uh, unfortunately, a bit of a sluggish bowel, then you start looking at the medication options. Examples in the beginning might be something like Senna or Lactulose. And if it's more uh, significant and, and problematic, uh, then you can uh, you can progress to more significant uh, laxatives such as uh, uh, Laxido, otherwise known as Movacol as well. Um, I know that we jokingly call it colon blow uh, in the profession, so it can be it can be quite strong, uh, which is exactly why you wouldn't progress to that um, unless you unless you've titrated up and you in fact very much need it. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. This is really good. And then final question on the medication. So a lot of these men get a uh, significant amount of bladder symptoms in that they can get uh, a lot of symptoms of overactive bladder. So mm. are there any typical medication that these men may, some of these men may come across? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, so, so, you know, we, we think about uh, the, with your overactive bladder, um, a classic medication uh, would, might be something like solifenacin. I don't know if you've uh, come yep, across that yep. one. You know, uh, mirabegron is another example. Um, but, but so you might want to look at it from the overactive bladder point of view. And then, of course, you, you might want to look at it from the, you know, is there any degree of benign prostatic hyperplasia there as well, uh, causing frequency? And maybe you've got a bit of a mixed picture of, 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 of BPH and overactive bladder, in which case you might consider tamsulosin for the prostate, um, you know, and, and, and of course, in gents above a certain age, you know, you might, you might consider things like finasteride to shrink down the prostate, but I, I'm drifting now into BPH rather than the overactive yeah, yeah, bladder. Yeah. 
But just to come back to the overactive bladder question, once again, it's really, uh, you know, solifenacin and mirabegra are good examples of what you might use there. And I think one thing that that's really important to us, particularly in your role, is is you having the time to explain to these men, you know, what these medication are and the importance of actually taking them. Yes, 100 percent. I mean, you've hit the nail on the head, having the time to, to do because all those things that we've just described, you know, the, the, the complete history, the, uh, the examination, the workup of the tests, the feedback on the tests and the subsequent management, you know, that, that all takes time. And uh, having the luxury of a little bit of time, you know, is, is, uh, is incredible in terms of outcome. So uh, for, for, for the patient's point of view, because once you've got understanding on both sides of the equation, you're probably familiar with, because you'll experience this as well, we call it the doctor and patient agenda. Once, once you can get the doctor and the patient agenda to align, which really happens once you've got time and good, you know, a good communication and rapport with your patient, um, what, you, what you then uh, can enjoy both as doctor and patient are excellent levels of concordance, meaning, meaning the plan of action for the treatment is adhered to and that increases the the uh, the long-term uh, beneficial outcomes which uh, which of course is what what we're trying to achieve yeah and time and communication is and rapport is important now Stuart your really big thing or, or one of your passions is uh, helping men with erectile dysfunction so mm. we're, we, we're going to do that in a separate uh, kind of interview uh, and, but I'd like to really thank you for your time this evening because I'm sure you'd rather be out in the sunshine <laughs> somewhere rather than speaking to me. But yeah. people will really appreciate your time and expertise. So thank you very much. And I really look forward to talking to you about erectile dysfunction. Okay, I'm oh, just going to turn this off.